This is Giles Martin, and you're listening for Fab Four Free For All. Hey, everybody, and welcome to a very special edition of the Fab Four Free For All. I am Mitch Axelrod, and I'm being joined by Rob Leonard tonight. Hello, everyone. How you doing? Uh, not by Tony Chiguardo, because, uh, and we'll, we'll tell you why Tony's not here, not that he doesn't want to be here, but um, we, uh, we've, we were privileged to have been invited to a listening event, I'm not going to call it a party, a listening event for the new Revolver box set. Right. Uh, on September 13th, 2022, as of this taping, uh, we went downtown to a beautiful recording studio in uh, New York City, and we were um, privileged to hear many tracks from the box set. We didn't hear them all. We're going to go through them now. Now, we've, every, anytime we've, uh, we've done a listening event uh, in the city for any new Beatle product, we always do these first impressions excitement shows. And right. normally we do them in the car, right, Rob? We've done them in the car. We've done it in a diner. Remember we've that one? <laughs> we've done it in the diner with the forks and everything clinking and people that was a great what one. we wanted. But you know what? We 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 really have been excited about all of these. Yes. Uh, and and yesterday, again, yesterday was September 13th as of this taping. We uh we were excited still. We we couldn't do a show yesterday uh, and record it um because uh, quite frankly, we were on a train and it just didn't work. Uh, right. That's, that's fine. It's, it's the next day. So it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But that doesn't mean we weren't excited. Believe me. Um, well, you know, also we, uh, we, we took a cab, then we took the train and we actually could have done it in, well, actually it was an Uber, but we actually could have done the Uber. It took us 25 minutes to go from 18th street to the garden. So yeah, you know, it didn't you, take that long. If anybody doesn't know New York city, uh, that's a long time for seven blocks. Well, yeah. Uh, bunch blocks. Yeah. But it was, but quite frankly, uh, you know, the, the experience we had yesterday was just amazing. Yep. We want to thank the people at Universal and the people at Apple for always inviting us. And stay tuned after we are done with our excitement because we were privileged to also have some time, as we always get, with Giles Martin. Uh, so the interview is going to follow our little, um, we sh- we our should. little impression video. And quite frankly, you know, we're a tough act to follow. <laughs> That's right. But uh, we should mention uh, we thank Jennifer for. Yes, Jennifer is, is part of Apple now. Yeah. Uh, so we, we thank everybody again, Universal, Apple, all the good folks that invited us and, and always invite us because we are very appreciative for any opportunity we yep. get to help uh, promote the Beatles and any solo Beatles. So, you know, we went into the studio. We saw a lot of good Beatle friends like the Lapidoses and Jeff Slate, uh, you know, and, and Ken Tom Womack. Jones we saw and, fr- Ken Womack, right? Dennis, Dennis Elsis was there, and uh, J.J. French, who's a, a writer as well as being Twisted from Twisted Sister. Just Sister. Uh, Steve, what's, uh, what's last? I keep calling Matteo. Mateo. Mateo. I keep calling Mateo. Yeah, and then we also, we did see Rob Sheffield from Rolling Stone, right. uh, Alan Light, and uh, Anthony DeCurtis. Just a lot of people who were there uh, enjoying yep. this with us. Um, and, and you could tell they were all enjoying it. So we were led into a, a room. Uh, and which was set up for Dolby Atmos. I mean, it's a gorgeous studio. So what we what we heard was the Atmos version of everything we're going to tell you about. But uh, from what we hear, and we have not been privy to the tracks yet. So unfortunately, you know, hopefully we will soon. But uh, again, October 28th is the release date. So uh, they didn't want to give us to us too early in fear of it might get out. So and I understand um, that. Yeah. Oh, me too. Uh, not that we've ever done that, but uh, still, you know, they want to be secretive about it, and, and that's fine. But, though we should say, Mitch, that Ringo has a box already. So. <laughs> well, Ringo was the one who let the cat out of the bag in, in general about the box. So We assume know. there were CDs in it. <laughs> well, I, I, I assume he might have any configuration he wants. But, and, and we'll get to Ringo in, during this because I have some really, I have some strong things to say about uh, Mr. Starkey, the drummer boy. But, um, you know, we, the, so what we heard was Atmos, uh, from, but from what we've heard, the stereo sounds really just as good. So, you know, the, even if you're hearing something bumped up in a song in Atmos, you, you still expect it to hear it, you hear it in stereo, uh, except maybe not, you know, as spacious around where you right. think it goes all around you, but it's still going to be up in the mix. So 
that being said, um, you know, Giles came on first and uh, he did a little, you know, show and tell with some of the tracks. He played us four tracks of outtakes and then we heard the whole album, including Paperback, Rider, and Rain. Um, and, well, we and, should say, Mitch, that he yeah. first did Taxman. Well, that's right. After, yes, I want to get that. Was, that that was at the beginning, wasn't it? I yes, think. yes. He did, he did a demonstration of Taxman. You know, but the one thing I was struck that he said to us, you know, he keeps saying, you know, people, people like what I do, people don't like what I do, and, and I understand both sides and purists and that. And, and the one thing he said, though, he said, we do it, and he said we, because it's not only Giles and Sam O'Kell, you know, it's with the permission and approval of the Beatles and the That's Beatles estates. He said, we do it to get you, meaning us, closer to the music, which I thought was very profound. We haven't heard that before. That's a nice phrase. I like yeah. that phrase. So he wanted, you know, everybody knows by now that they use the Peter Jackson AI, you know, artificial intelligence um, um, technique or um, not, not technique, um, but they used it to uh, to separate out a lot of the tracks. So as Rob said, he played us a demo of Taxman where he just had some guitars, drums, and bass. And as he was talking, he said, okay, here comes the bass is going to leave and the bass left. And then the guitar... Well, the guitar left. Actually, the guitars went first, then it went to the bass, and then the drums. The reason I say that is... Well, I'll let you continue, but there's... No, a, go ahead. There's, well, the thing about the, the guitars, you know, it's, it's Paul's lead... You know, we, we all know it's in the middle, and then they retaped it over the end. But the thing that got me, once I got rid of the guitars, it's the bass and the drums. And during this, uh, the line, the middle part, of if you drive your car, I'll tax your street section, Paul's bass, I never really realized it, Paul's bass is so intensely busy. Yeah. And I never really caught that because there's other music and everything going around it. But when he was just individualized, oh, my God. Yeah. I was really impressed with that. And then he, he fades it down and it's down to the drums. And then he then he fades it down, it's down what to the snare, I think it was. Well he faded down to each individual drum until yeah, the yeah. snare. And he wanted to show you that they could take the you know the individual tracks out, uh, including oh. parts of the drums. Now in our interview, which you'll hear after this. Uh, the first question I ask is about this AI right. technology and, and about separating the drums. So you'll hear more about that. We, you know, let the expert tell you. We won't. But, but literally, the song ended with like Ringo's snare, just hitting snare. And you just yep. went, wow, how, how are they doing that? You know well, what that reminded me of? What's that? 1987, George Martin playing Sgt. Pepper off the four track. Oh, yeah. And then he's fading each track. And you're standing there like, oh, my God. And now yeah, yeah. you can do it on Revolver because the technology is there. And even, you couldn't do it individually for Pepper, obviously, then. But now you probably could because they did debounce everything with, right. with all of them, and including, uh, including Revolver now. So I, I was very impressed with what Giles did. I don't, realize, I don't know if he realized that he was, like, literally doing what his dad did. You know, he's, well, I he, don't think he thought of it that way. He might not have, but he does. One thing that Giles does talk about, and I asked him uh, one of our interviews, you know, you, you come in, you hear your dad, and he, does he act like you're uh, the, da hit the dad role, so to speak, with the Beatles and you, and you say, hey, I've heard that before as a dad, as, you know, being the son. So to me, you know, he, he's, he's, very, he's very noticeable, or he notices his father's talking to the Beatles. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah, so, you know, I, I was just wondering. I didn't think about it till afterwards. You know, de de bouncing tax man is the same thing his father did with Sergeant Pepper. So yeah, you know, so it was, uh, it was nice to see. It was, it, you know, what he did say that they didn't use the technology on the voices because it's a little harder. Yeah, uh, but he did it on the instrumentation, and uh, wow, and, and 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 it's a shame. You know, we got to interview him prior to the listening session we were supposed to listen to uh, talk to him after but uh luckily actually we got there early and he did it before because we got more time with him than we would have had after so that was good but the disadvantage is that we didn't get to listen to the tracks and then ask him about stuff but we had heard and read all the articles he had you know been doing lately so right. at least we knew what to ask but 
the, the tax man demo was just amazing. And as Rob said, you know, we'll talk about it when we hear the whole. Well, well Mitch, I, I'm going to hold up. Uh, this is only on the video part. What am I doing right now? You're holding up two fingers. fingers. Yeah. You oh. know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's an in-joke about the That's an in-joke for uh, the 19 minutes we got with Giles. Yeah, he kept, uh, when people tried to stop the interview or at least tell us it's it's just about over, he kept shooing them away and said, yeah. two more minutes, two more minutes. And we yep. kept getting two more minutes. But again, we've interviewed him now, what, five times? Uh, I think so. And he, and he like recognizes that. us when we see, meet him. He goes, hey, guys, how you doing? Well, we, we have faces that you cannot <laughs> forget. I hope so. <laughs> well, I, I didn't mean it in a good way. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, meanwhile, we're on YouTube right now. <laughs> oh, it's all right. We have faces for radio and we know it. Um, yeah. He, he started out by playing the take five of Got to Get You to My Life. Now, for most of you, you say, oh, well, we've heard the giggle one on the anthology. This is the one without the giggling. No, and, and your bird can sing. I'm sorry. No, right, right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Get, got to Get You to My Life with the chatter. Right. Take right. five. You're right. That's next, by the way. Um, and I love the chatter on the outtakes because you really get to hear the mood of the Beatles um, when, you know, when they're recording. And, and Giles said at one point, you know, this is them not really being the five headed, five headed, the four headed monster uh, wearing suits, even though Giles pointed out that later on they, they did pepper and wore suits. But um, good point. Yeah. He, but he said that, that, you know, even though they were going their separate, starting to go their separate ways, um, personally, musically, they were just all, everything was settled with the music and everything was all for one and one for all. And, and you know, you could hear it in the chatter. And, you know, the, the Got to Get You to My Life is interesting because they're trying to decide on the, how to open it, whether you open it with the horns or that, you know, the uh, synthesizer that they had. Yeah. So very, very, very interesting, you know. Uh, did you have any points about it, Rob? Or? I, I really, I mean, part of it, we've heard the variation of uh, on the anthology too. So, yeah. but we didn't have the chatter. So to me, the chatter is, is kind of important because you don't hear so much about the Beatles talking about Revolver. It was done very quickly and then they went on a tour. Um, so they, when they were on the tour, they didn't talk about the album as much because they were on tour and that's not what people want to talk about. They want to talk about John and Jesus. <laughs> so, um, so to me, that when they're talking about or talking about the music on Revolver, which is my favorite album, it, it goes back and forth, but right now it's my favorite album, then I really enjoy the background of what they're talking about and how they're, you know, it's all about the music. And you can tell, you know, they're having fun, even oh, yeah. though they're trying to figure all this stuff out. And, you know, I, when you think about Revolver, you know, and I'm just, this wasn't what we heard, but this I've always noticed. Revolver had several songs that they totally changed the arrangements on. Oh yeah. Very quickly. And that includes got to get you into my life. You know, that I need your love part was taken out. It all of a sudden the horns get in there. It changes the song. Oh, so, absolutely. And it was cool to hear. So then, then we went to Anya Burke and sing, as I mentioned in, yeah. the, in the beginning with no giggles. And it's, it's, as Rob said, you know, again, a different version of the song, which if they would have left it like this, it would have been a fine song, fill, you know, album filler, uh, album cut. But but still, uh, it would have been fine because everybody said it's like the birds when we heard the one with the giggling. And, he, and they're right. But at the end of this one, John says that was it, right? Meaning he really thought that that was going to be the, the, the take that they were going to use on the album. But Giles said afterwards, you know, the Beatles most of the time finished. And the next day they came in, heard the track again, and said, let's do it over. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's the important thing. I mean, they they know it could be better. Like you said, it's it's a great version. Yeah. Without the giggles, it's you know, it's what you would want in a song, but they're thinking other ways of doing this. And they come back and they say, Okay, you know, we're gonna do a different version. But it also part of the revolver thing is the guitars had such a ring on it. And, and and your bird can sing doesn't really have that ring the way it finally does when it, the final released version, right? You know, so um, and maybe that was part of the reason they did that too. I, I really enjoyed it. I I always was upset where I mean I like the fact that the giggling on the version that's on it's anthology, learn, yeah. But I, at the same time, I I recognize underneath it is a great version, and you know we get it now on the on this version of Revolver, so. 
I'm finally glad that version is out, so to speak. And, well, and that, you know, that's what, what speaks, so you know, it is out. We we get both because and and but now the giggling one gets some context. Yes. Because now you get it without the giggling, and then they try to go over it with the giggling, you know, because yep. they're trying to, you know, double track or whatever they're doing. And so now you understand what why it was like that. It's it's more insight to the greatest band yeah. in the world. And and Giles did say many times, including our interview, that the Beatles were not infallible. They made mistakes. Sure. And, but but the good thing about the Beatles is very, you know, uh, most of the time, you know, 99% of the time, they went back and made it better <laughs> they took their mistakes and they made it much better yeah know? that's that's you know that goes back to norwegian wood among other things where that's not a bad version but let's see if we can do it a don't start people on norwegian wood because that's rubber soul and you know already people are asking hey where's rubber soul we didn't even get a revolver yet but people are asking hey that's got to come out too well hard. i didn't see giles denying there was going to be rubber soul next well <laughs> Well, check out our interview again. I did try to sneakily. I know. I, saw, I, I was with you, Mitch. I was with oh, you. I know, but I'm telling everybody when you when you listen, I tried to sneak a uh, confession out of him or at least an exclusive that, that we're going to be hearing more. So check out. Remember to, to watch the interview. Uh, the next thing he played was take two of Eleanor Rigby. Uh, this was just the this was George Martin with the players in the orchestra, the musicians in the orchestra. And Paul was in the control room. Yep. Yeah, uh, on the talkback mic, and George Martin is talking to the musicians, and and Giles even said, you know, my father. I thought my father always hired, you know, all these upper crusty musicians to orchestra players who didn't care about rock and roll. But as you hear in this chatter, they're they're all so engaged in the song and and the arrangement. And George Martin talks to Paul, and they do it in two different ways. And then he says to Paul, well, you know, which one you like better? He's like, well, I really don't hear much of a difference. Um, but then they play. Well, he asked he about vibrato. He goes, do you yeah. want the vibrato or not? He goes, well, I don't, I don't hear much difference because uh, this is vibrato and this is not. And Paul's like, uh, I don't know. But, yeah. but then George says to Paul, listen, we're going to do the whole thing. And, and uh, you know, tell me if it's, if it's too fast or too slow. And they do the whole thing. And my jaw just dropped. It, oh yeah. You know, yeah, we've gotten. I think we've gotten the instrumentation before separated. Uh, isn't well, it was style? on uh, anthology two. Yeah, and one of the things they did, and it's not going to be part of anything, but I I really liked how on the love disc they took the orchestration of love and made it an intro to Eleanor Rigby. Oh, that's on love, I should say. Yeah, that's they on used love, it. Right. They cut it into an intro to be for Eleanor Rigby, which to me actually helps the song because it's so short to begin with. Right. And, and you sort of get used to the strings right away instead of just boom. So that was, you know, the thing I liked about it was, you know, the, the, the string guys were really cool. You know, they, as you said, they weren't, you know, snooty guys. And, you know, I, I always thought that George Martin maybe should have got a writing credit for, oh, yeah. or a part writing credit, at least for that song, because. Well, now when you hear this, you definitely. <laughs> you yeah, that's why. Cause he's, he's there with them and, you know, Paul is there, but you know, it, you know, yeah, but it's Paul's like, not scoring it. George Martin. No, did. no, he 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 hears it in his head, but you know, it's George Martin on the floor. So, yeah, just a, a wonderful. When you hear it, you'll understand our excitement about it because yeah, you, you know, you really get a different feel for Eleanor Rigby. Even though Eleanor Rigby's always been a great song, uh, right. you know, you just the context behind the song now, which is what most of these outtakes do. But well, I, I like so great. so far on all the outtakes so far. We've heard a lot of chatter, which is nice to hear. You know, I like hearing all that stuff, and you know, I think it helps. You know how you understand the record at this point in in life. I mean, it's you know, the record is fifty five years old, so we're fifty six yeah, years but, old. So. And, but also understanding that when the Beatles did this, they're three years removed from "Please Please Me." Yeah, and well, and, and they're you know they're doing. And this she loves you. Yeah. And she loves you. Yeah. And they're doing this incredible orchestration. And then later, you know, for no one. And, and I mean, and here, there and everywhere. But it, it was it's really good. You, you got to hear it yourself and, and you will. And I'm sure you're going to love it. And, and the last outtake to me just blew me away. It was so revelatory. Um, it, it was the Yellow Submarine. And by now you've heard that uh, it's a, you know, John started off with a, uh, like a very sad ballad. And I've I've always thought that Yellow Submarine really was the only song that didn't really fit on Revolver. 
Um, and we get it on the Yellow Submarine album anyway, but so I think it's one of the few songs we get twice on the, on, in the Beatles album catalog. Well, yeah, well, that's right. All you needed yeah. to love was an EP. So, right. So, this is the British world. Correct. But, you know, the, he played John's solo demo and it sounds great. It's not one of these like, you know, her, 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 her. it was really beautiful sounding. He must have done well, it. Well, it was in the studio. So that's well, the beautiful was it in the studio or the second yeah. one was. Oh, maybe it sounds like it's in the studio it because like most of John's right. demos, you know, were like far away or they weren't complete and they were, you know, he didn't do good demos in the sense, oh, I'm going to save this and I really care. And it was more very, you know, but this, the version we heard was fantastic. It's, you know, it's oh, a yeah, whole yeah. song. And well, it, it's the same lyric, but he does, he sings in the town where I was born, no one cared, no one cared. Now it right. doesn't sound like the jaunty, you know, children's song that, that it turned out to be for Ringo. It's a sad, as, as Giles said, like a Woody Guthrie type song. And it's not, you know, it's, it's not even the, sung the same way as, as the final version. And then he just keeps repeating it. And it's so sad and it gives you a different feel for, for Yellow Submarine. And also as Giles put it and, and everybody here probably thought that John and Paul worked on it, but mostly Paul, cause it's like a kid song and Paul did it and John might've helped you know, with some of the lyrics and background vocals and all that stuff. But this is John. This is well, John, it's John starts it. I think yeah. it is definitely a Lennon McCartney song because Paul oh, comes yeah. in with the, the, the chorus and, you know, the, the marching band stuff. And, you know, I th that's more Paul. But John, you know, in the town, you know, that whole party keeps he knows he has something there. Yes. And he, it's just not moving to where it's going to be a finished song yet. But it kind of is. Um, if you were to re you know print that as a lyric, you'd say, "Oh, okay, that's pretty good." Um, but it reminds me of um, like "Child of Nature." You yeah. know, he he writes "Child of Nature." He knows it's a good song, but by the time he gets to record it or wants to record it, he goes, "I really don't want to do it." Then it becomes "Jealous Guy" two years later. Right now, Paul didn't help him with that, obviously, but that same mentality of, you know, instead of waiting, he, you know, John said, "Okay, let's try to change this now," and Paul's there to help him. You know, it's very much a Lennon McCartney song. Now we know we know more about it because and, of the, the recording. And the second outtake they played is now John and Paul in the studio, right? Going over it now. The lyrics have been flushed out for the most part. Right. For the most part, it's still not the jaunty children's song. No, it's not. It's still going in a different folky direction, but the chorus is now getting itself together. Uh, where they do sing, you know, both of them sing, we all live in a yellow submarine, and, and Paul yells, look out, you know, and so it's really totally different, and, and I'm, I would have loved to have heard this prior to our interview, because I would have then asked him, at what point does it become the kid's song with Ringo singing it? You know, I don't know right, if right. heard all the outtakes or we're ever going to get that progression, uh, and I'll have to probably read Mark Lewison's recording sessions book again, uh, but wow, I mean, this is just this is no, I, I, I agree with you. I, I, yeah, we never heard this as a bootleg ever, and that helps tremendously because you yeah. just like your mouth is you know it dropped, and I really was impressed with it. And you know that might have been something where on Stra on anthology two, Strawberry Fields Forever has the different versions that lead to the final version. That would have been maybe the song if you're going to pick one song to like start off with and then follow it through to the end. That might have been the song to do that. Now, they don't do that very often on any of these no. box sets, but that might have been the one maybe to say, look, this is, you know, you know, this is the jaunty children's song that everyone loves and sings along to, but it started out somewhere else. So, we, you know, we don't even know how many takes they, they have. Of, like Strawberry Fields is a million takes. You're right. We, we yeah, that's them. true. But you, you know, don't we, know how many takes of this they have. Yeah, well, that's, they that, given us, that's something that if we had known afterwards, if we'd heard it before we interviewed Giles, which we probably would have asked. That would have been one of the questions. Yeah, definitely. And we, and we didn't get to ask him anything afterwards because then, you know, he went to lunch and there was another session. Well, he afterwards. also had three other interviews, so. Well, I think he had a couple of others, yeah. Yeah, so um, we weren't. Not many, so we, we, were, we felt very privileged about that and way. We were. No ego here. It's just really, you know, it was cool because, uh, again, uh, you know, he likes us so, and he trusts the way we ask questions. We're not just, we're not, we're not like the typical press who, 
who don't know much about Beatles, but they get invited to these things. <laughs> and then, you know, they well, we saw a couple of those people. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> no, the, not, what we, I think not gonna go personally, it was, we don't blame him for not putting on certain things. Yeah. Like if you go online, why did Giles not put this on? Well, it's not his decision. You know, it's, you know, he works for four people. It's their decision. His right. job is to make it sound as good as possible. And then they decide what they're going to do with it. And, so, and, just so if you're well, Sam O'Kell, we should mention Sam, even though we've never met. Yeah, we, I did. Uh, oh, okay. but, in, but also don't forget that, uh, you know, there's no outtakes for good day sunshine and I'm not going right. to tell you the answer. It, it's in the interview. We asked him. That's right. So, right. So just, uh, so if you're wondering, well, how come you never listen to the interview? He does explain. Um, so then we got to hear the whole album and, and he's funny because he said, now you're going to be forced to hear the whole album. Like, Forced. <laughs> yeah, for uh, Well, he's and, got uh, a good sense of humor. You know, oh, yeah, who forgets that? Listen, he was he was very humorous yesterday. You know, there was some technicalities, things going on, technical failings, and he handles it so well. Um, and and everybody did. And you know, it didn't matter because we all knew we were going to hear the album. So you know, at one point the lights went off a couple of times. It doesn't matter as long as you're listening to the the Beatles and Revolver. Uh, it could have been pitch black for the whole time. I didn't care. It didn't uh, bother me. No, not at all. <laughs> but then he played the whole album, including, like I said, Paperback, Rider, and Rain. And no, we did not get to hear the Fast Rain, where Ringo supposedly sounds like Keith Moon. Can't wait yep. to hear that one. I mean, I'm... Well, I'm, you can't play every one because you want right. people, you know, well, you to, want people be to be surprised, surprised on October 28th. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we'll run through each song very, very, very quickly and give our initial impressions. Uh, Taxman, the bass and drums... Uh, we're the very whole bottom end of that. It's just yeah. incredible. Yeah, a lot of people are complaining that the bass is too much, but you know what? I don't think so. And um, and then we, you know, during the session, we I asked Giles who does the count in for uh, for Taxman because in the LA listening event he said it was Paul, and uh, so I asked it on purpose because I knew he said Paul, and I thought everybody would want to hear. Oh wow, Paul did, and it would be like ooh, but no, he threw me under the bus. And yeah, he did. Uh, he didn't mean it, obviously, but he, he said, no, I don't know who does it, but uh, I'm sure you do. And I went, I was thinking to myself, wait, you just told people. But anyway, <laughs> he says it's George now. So, you know what? We'll find out soon enough. But it sounded great. Uh, Eleanor Rigby, what do you say? I mean, it sounds, yeah. for those of you who have heard the song track and Eleanor Rigby and Love You Too are on that, uh, done remixed by Peter Cobbins. So it wasn't done by Giles, but I think... Both of these songs sound so much better on this. Uh, the Eleanor Rigby just comes at you, and and yeah, and the strings, you know, which are patterned after Psycho, uh, the orchestration in Psycho. Not Herman, but not yeah. Herman. Yep. Uh, wow. I mean, they just, you know, again, in Atmos, it was amazing. Uh, I'm sure when I listen on my headphones or on a good speaker system, it's gonna blow you yeah, away. Yeah, and, and you think about the song track, and I, I'm a big fan of the song track. But I also think the song track is made more for the movie, like you're in the theater. There's, I think that was part of the, the attitude of let's ha this is how we remix it. Um, you know, you, Eleanor Rigby on this new version sounds fantastic. And, and the song track always bothered me on Eleanor Rigby because when they sing All the Lonely People, there's, there's Paul's double track voice from the ADT. It's a slight hair off. Yes. I yes. think this is not. Uh, this yeah, that's the type of thing. But, you know, it's funny. They fix that. But on Happiness is a Warm Gun, on the stereo version, they left right. a little fade in there where it fades up before the, where that vocal they took out. But they, then it fades up, which isn't on the mono, but they left it on the remix of the stereo, which, right. I, you know, that bothered me a little bit. But Yeah, well, you know. You know, you know they, match, they match what came out, but it's that, that's the thing you want to fix. <laughs> well, they never fixed, well, I, I think they did fix the uh, fade out in Day Tripper. Uh, the, 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 the dropout, yeah. The yeah, well, that happened out. beforehand, but yeah, they, they I know. I know. But, uh, I'm only sleeping the drums and bass again. Wow. And John's voice is so up and it just, you know, it, it does sound so good. Right. You know what? I, I, I called our friend Rob Koenig afterwards and I said, Rob, there is now a fifth remix of I'm only sleeping because he loves the song. And he, yeah. I remember years ago, he goes, well, you know, there's four mixes. And I said, well, I thought there was only three. And then he pulls out the fourth one, but now there's a fifth one. And I was like, okay, Rob, you, you know, more, more intense uh, looking into the song because uh, it, is a, it, it is a little different. I, I actually was I, – I didn't think that the, you were in 
bombarded by the backward tapes as the way you are in the other ones. I thought that was my only little qualm about that. You, you know, usually the backward tapes threw you off a little bit. This is more involved. With, you know, it's mixed into the song better, I think. Yeah, it sounds. I mean, again, when you're when you're listening in Atmos, you know, they're swirling all over you. So it's it yeah, that's true. Sounds that's great, true. but uh, love you too. Uh, it sounds amazing. The the vocal is in the middle. Uh, yep. Wow, did that just and the vocal? It, you know, it screams out at you, but it's not, you know, like uh, obtrusive or anything. It's just it's it's very well mixed. So it yep. just sounded really good. I mean, it, it's you know that song I always love too. I think Paul said at one point that that's the only song that didn't really fit on Revolver. He did it in some interview a while back. But really, yeah, I think he's wrong. And quite frankly, you know, it's again it's ingrained in our brain, just like Yellow Submarine is. So we wouldn't have revolver any other way, but uh, remix is, is beautiful. Yes. Um, here, there, and everywhere. I was concerned here because I I always said that the Real Love CD single has, you know, the, the Paul vocal and then the flying in of the back right. vocals. And I always said, oh, that sounds so pretty. I hope the remix one day sounds like this. Um, I think Giles did it very, and Sam, did it very respectfully. They didn't, they didn't bump up the background vocals to, to over to be overbearing on the on the main vocal uh, on the lead. I, I think it was very respectful, um, not overdone. Uh, the 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 bass line I've never really noticed on this, and I mean I've noticed it, but you know again they bump it up and it just the combination of everything is just amazing. I, I agree. One thing I noticed in the middle of the song there was a ooh part which you really don't hear on the regular stereo version or the mono version. But here, they raised it just enough to notice it, but not enough to intrude. Right. I thought that was very nice, actually. I thought that added to the song. Yep. Uh, Yellow Submarine. This is weird because I loved it. Um, but it starts off um, almost like the Real Love 2015 mix, uh, where the Real Love you know, starts off with a guitar strum um, and... And now Yellow Submarine, I think you hear the guitar strum a lot more when he starts the song, you know, in. You know, right. You, broom, you hear the guitar strum a lot more. Uh, and it, it does sound really good. The sound effects sounded great. And, and he, he left in, I don't know whether it's the mono, probably the mono version has Sky of Blue, Sea of Green, right? Yeah, he, you know, he, he, he does follow the mono mixes and then enhances it a little more but the, you know he the mono mixes are the guides and then yeah. he, you know he, he gets a little more creative based on that but um yellow submarine was okay it's it's funny because we mentioned eleanor rigby to him and when we were interviewing him and i said you know one of the reasons people understand that song so well because it was released as a single people heard on top 40 radio so you know it wasn't as shocking because they had disc jockeys talking up songs even though that didn't have an intro but um but it was a, a single, so, and Hello Submarine, you know, another song that that's the way out there. Yeah, so. It was really you know, a both, double A side. Yeah, so both of those songs, if you heard it on Top 40 Radio in 1966, and FM Radio really wasn't there yet. Right. You know, you were hearing two different songs compared oh to what goodness. you might normally get from the Beatles. But the funny thing is with, like I was saying, the sky of blue, sea of green where John mimics Ringo. Right. Uh, and they always have, uh, the the first line mixed out, and right? He left it in, and, yes. You know the sky of blue, and it's very prominent. So, you know, yep. it's very fun. Uh, but someone asked him about that. Hey, I, I noticed you left it in, and he's like, I did. <laughs> you know, he's not a, a Beatles historian. No, he he's doesn't. not. But he, 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 know, he But he knows he knows the tapes, as yeah. he said. He's, you know, he was there when they transferred him to digital. He's listened to them all for when he did the love soundtrack. You know, he has notes for every song, so he knows them, you know, um, you know, you know, maybe yeah. if he wants to hire us, we can help him. <laughs> but he did say, you guys know more about the history, not not me and Rob, but, and, and by the way, I should say that Tony had a prior commitment. We should have said that up front. Yeah, well, you said you would say at the end, but I, yeah, I was well, waiting for Well, it. I was going to say, actually, in the beginning, um, that he had a prior commitment. He just couldn't make it, not that he didn't right. want to make it, because sure. Lord knows he wanted to be there. Hopefully um, he introduces the show, no, he <laughs> our show today. Hopefully but he did the, it. Uh, you know, he said, 
oh, I did leave it in there for the sky blue. He said, you know, I don't, I hear these things. And I, if I think it should be in the song, I'm putting it in. And, right. and, you know, and obviously he needs the approval of everybody. He's not just making a Giles Martin mix, but, right, right. uh, because then he could do whatever the hell he wants. But, uh, so he, he left it in there and, you know, he, he he doesn't really know about all the history, but it's nice he left it in there because it, it's it's always been fun. So, well, uh, you know, there's there's oddities all over the place, yeah. you know, and that's one of them. You know, the mono mixes have tons of oddities compared to the stereos. The uh, the next song, she said, she said, uh, oh man, listen to the interview and you'll find out if Paul is definitively on it or not. We're according to Charles at least. Don't say uh, anything. One thing about she said, she said. John's rhythm guitar yep. is really noticeable in that song and Rain. Yes. Um, I mean, you hear him strumming hard, which you don't really hear in the, the, you know, the regular revolver version. I was very impressed with that. Yeah. Because, the... you know, it's nice to hear John's rhythm. John always thought his rhythm guitar was mixed down by George Martin. Yeah, the um, drums were up a bit too, and that was always nice. And I got to tell you, I said I would say something about Ringo. Ringo was the glue in this album. I don't care what anybody says. He, I don't care if, if but each one of the other Beatles told him what to play, he still had to play it. And yep. Ringo on this track, she said, she said, is an animal. I mean, almost as I think it's even better playing than Rain. Listen to what he does on this. I mean, it's not typical, you know, drumming. No, it's just not. No. And and Ringo had to play it. And let me tell you something. It was good. So yeah, I agree. I th you know it's you, you learn a lot more about Ringo in this album and and Pepper yeah. to an extent. Um, well, did, did a most, lot of yeah. This one more though. Differences he's just, there. He's just that, which is why again I can't wait to hear how fast he plays on on Rain with that same exact pattern. Uh, right. Good day, sunshine. Um, I it it was good, very good. I didn't notice much of a difference here. Uh, except the end again. Now we were listening in Atmos. So the very end when they're they're going up and register and going good day, good day, good. Yeah. It was swirling around me. So I was like, oh, that's great. And 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 if we do get the the Blu-ray or the stream of the Atmos and five one, which listen to the interview, I did ask because a lot of you are saying how come. Um, if we do get it, I'm gonna you know it, it'll be really great. Uh, but this one I didn't notice anything too different. Well, the thing I notice about all the songs is the fade outs go on what sound like an extra second or two. Now, maybe that's the Atmos. I don't know. Uh, but they seem to, like, go a little bit longer. Yeah. Which doesn't bother me at all. I like that type of thing. Uh, Anya Bird can sing. John's vocal to me was very up. Yes. Uh, and, and, and that's not a bad thing. Not a bad yep. thing at all. I thought it was. I thought it sounded great. It's just a great song, and you know the punch of it coming in has always been good on any version I've ever heard. And this one just you know adds more to it. It's really. Good. I, I agree. I th also, his his strumming is noticeable. I also noticed the two guitars playing together. Yeah. Seems, seems slightly separated more. Really, um, just I a little bit. Nothing, that. nothing major, but I can I can pick out almost who's John and who's George. I mean, who's Paul and who's George on that. So, cause yeah, I don't want to play it uh, simultaneously. Yep. Uh, so. For no one. I, I didn't know that the drums and cymbal work <laughs> were there. I mean, yeah, very, it sounds great on this. And I mean, it, it sounds like a, fr all of these songs sound so open and fresh and like they like they could be on the radio now and you'd be like all right that's that's a cool song yeah, they, yeah for no, for one, no like, one you know has that that great. percussion parts and you know that you don't notice as much because it's first of all it's sad lyrics second of all you hear a lot of piano it's almost you know it's basically a paul solo song uh but at that time it, it was a beatles so and yeah. you know we knew ringo played on it, but you just don't hear it a lot this you hear a lot more of it yeah it, ringo i should say yeah it, it's just it's great it's we know it's a great song. Uh, Dr. Robert, the snare drum is in your face. Yeah, it um, is. Dr. Robert, which is not a bad thing because um, it gives the whole song that punch. It sounds a, a little, um, I'm trying to think of the word, like staccato, the snare drum. So it, there's not much effect on it. So it sounds, you know, a little bit staccato. But really, Dr. Robert sounded great. There was, you know, again, all of these sound good. And we're very excited for everything. Uh, we just may not have noticed on, on initial listening 
you know, what we will hear later. Right, right. Because you only get one time to listen. And if you're, you're so excited hearing it, and if you don't, you know, if you're not writing down, you know, I, I do write down notes. We both do. Uh, yep. But, um, you know, if you don't, we're in the dark and I'm trying to write notes. And, and if you didn't get, you know, we're not listening for certain things, I know that when we finally get the music, I'll be listening to each song 10 times just to hear any separation and stuff. But sure. uh, I want to tell you, or I want to tell you, um, sounds really like very spatial and, and the harmonies sound really great too now. Well, the fade in is more like the mono, where it starts a little bit higher, where the stereo starts at zero and fades up. Right. This started a little bit higher. I was hoping, and maybe, maybe it's going to be a bonus track, I would like to hear a regular version of that song with a regular open. It's not the fade up that you hear on the stereo. I'd like to hear it as, as a dry open with that, that riff, that descending riff. Well, it's funny I, I love they, that song. I love they, that you song. Know, that's the second time they did that. The first, first time being eight days a week. Right. Yeah, uh, but, but you know, with eight, with eight days a week, they did remix it to have yes. it, you know, not fade up uh, in the video thing and on a couple other things. So I'm hoping that in you know box set, it, there is a version that's like that because to me, it it's a great open, and I know why they did it because the previous song fades out in that weird way. They don't have right. it fade out high; it fades out low. So they're doing it on purpose. It fades out low. They start the next song low and raise it. There's a, there's a purpose for that, that fade in. So, but at this point, you know, it'd be nice to have the you know, regular just open. Yeah. So. And then got to get you to my life. What, what do you say? I mean, everybody's right. complaining about the drums not being in the mix in the original and any version we've heard, whether it's the remasters and the originals, and they're right. You know, the drums are so low in the mix. Not anymore. Uh, th nope. They're not. They're not intrusive. They're not as loud as you think they may. You may want them to be. Yep. But yep. they're they're in the mix enough where you where you're like, oh wow, there's drums there. Yes. And, yes. But now you hear them, especially right before Paul sings, "Got to Get You to My Life." You know the. Duh, 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 duh. Yes, I know. I agree. Not like very little with it. You now you really hear them and. And so I'm glad he did that. And again, very respectful. It's not, you know, normally with the bass and drums with Giles on a few of these things, you know, it, it's, hey, Paul and Ringo, here you go. Uh, we're throwing you a bone. But this one. Or it could be that Paul and Ringo say, hey, raise us. Well, you yeah, well, yeah I'm, <laughs> I'm giving him the you know, benefit of the doubt here. You but, work for us. You will do what we say. But this one, he did it respectfully. He could have done Ringo blasting in your face with that, with that basic, I'm going to say drum solo right before right. he sings the chorus, but um, it, it's not. It's done very respectfully. And so for those of you who are concerned that they're not in the mix, they are now. Oh, uh, yeah. And then Tomorrow Never Knows, you know, uh, what do you say? The drums just hit you in the face. The sound effects now are wow. Um, it's just a, a, you know, it's, I didn't notice a hell of a lot of difference other than the fact that it just sounds so good. You know, it just... It, I, I agree. There's not a big difference in how we hear that song the way it's already is you know there was no major differences to me at least you know yeah, so yeah obviously the drums but the drums were pretty high up not high up but very noticeable in the original mix so you even if it's not as high in the mix you right. definitely notice that Ringo has so this prevalent. offbeat drum on a whole thing yeah and so you hear that maybe it's not high enough or whatever but it was definitely there so I and 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 we'll just lump paperback writer and rain together uh, for now, they, the new 2022 mix, stereo mix, just the, the both tracks sound awesome. I mean, you know, well, no, nothing crazy. Well, I think Paperback Writer is a fantastic mix for stereo. Yeah. It, it has, um, it ha you know, the, the stereo version was always too separated. This is really together. Um, it's, it's actually closer to the mono mix. It is. But it's, it's, you know, it's separate, you know, it's a separate channel. So to me, I was like, wow, there's no holes in it where the stereo mix to me had holes in it. Yeah. And, and again, rain the same thing, I think. Yeah, I thought Sounds so. really good. And, and I mentioned jo John's guitar playing, his, his strumming on that is very yeah. noticeable. And it doesn't sound at all muddy. It just sounds open and fresh. Yes, it, it really does. does. Really the good. whole album, again, you know, that's all we heard. Um, the whole album just sounds good. Revolver. I mean, you know, to me, it's their masterpiece. I don't care what 
people say about Pepper, and I know Pepper is a masterpiece because culturally things were going on as well, Summer of Love, and so everybody considers masterpiece. To me, Revolver's always been their masterpiece, and they're, I didn't notice it until Giles said it, and then when you listen again, the album is, there's, there's so many different music styles going on on, on this album, and you, you know, you notice it when you're hearing it again, loud and, and fresh and, 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 and in fine form. Um, but wow, it's, it's really an eclectic album uh, from start to finish. And, and, and in the interview you'll, you'll hear, I, I asked Giles specifically, um, did your father ever talk to you about it? Because, uh, you know, the first song they brought in was Tomorrow Never Knows for a new Beatles album after Rubber Soul. And if, you know, you heard what you heard on the anthology take one, and you can only imagine, you know, what uh, George Martin's reaction would be. So, you know, it's in the interview. You'll, you'll hear what he said. And, and, and Giles also, you know, he adds a lot to his answer uh, about how open his dad was. So, uh, again, um, we're pretty much done here. It's yep. exciting as hell. I mean, it's, it's Revolver. It's, it's the Beatles. I know the Ble Beatles' Bloody White album shut up. But it's the Beatles' Revolver. And... You can't help but not shut up because I'm going to be saying it forever that, you know, if you're if you're not going to buy this set because it doesn't have a Blu-ray, you're going to miss out. I know you can listen on Spotify and all right. that, but, you know, you, you have to listen with headphones. I implore you. I implored you on the Facebook page. You need to listen to this with headphones or on a good system. Um Please. Oh, don't 5.1 would have been nice on this. I, you know, we're not sure why uh, he addresses only... it and we, we're probably going to get it and, yeah, and, but, and... but it sort of came out with this that's all i mean yeah, i understand I and... why but you know the 5.1 should be for every beatles album it should be for every, every paul uh, solo release which he hasn't done a lot either so but you know what and, and considering that they were able to take apart the instrumentation right. it's right. perfect for 5.1 or 7.1 yeah, or wherever you wherever, know wherever you want to go with it but yeah but you know it's you know because you don't want to go back and buy something else down the road again. You know, this well gets let's to the hope, point where this might... as he says in the interview that they make it available streaming and yeah. And now he so didn't let's... say they've done it. That's the thing. He didn't say that, but whoops. well, he alludes to it. He he does allude to it, does he does. But that's it for us. I mean, you yeah. know, if we could have been in the coffee shop in the city, we would have been. And we would have been, you know, excited about it just like we are now. Our our excitement is, is a little tempered because it's a day after. Uh, but I know last night I was thinking about it all night and, and, and I, I called my friend, I called, like I said, I called our friend Rob Koenig to tell him about I'm only sleeping. I called my friend Frank Walker today and gave him a, you know, track by track rundown. Uh, like you just, what, just what we did. Yeah. And, um, you know, he was all excited. So, you know, yeah. you know, we, 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 I figured let's, let's do the show and we'll get it out to everyone Then we don't have to tell yeah, anyone. Right, so I'm, I'm. We'll tell them to listen to the podcast. Well, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you're all going to love it. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be some of you who might say, "Well, you know, I don't like what Giles does," and, and okay, fair enough. We're not telling everybody to, to love it just because we do. All we're telling you is actually, I am. I mean, you don't, but well, I, I think you should well, like it because of what we say, and plus, the work on it is. <laughs> you, you know what? If it's always imagine, a labor of love, it's a labor of love, but there's also, you know. You just can't turn it into something else. You can't just, you know, do totally different mix of what the original thing is. It has right. to be kind of respectful. The technology makes it a lot better and yeah. fuller as a song or songs. And that's the important thing. You know, I have no problem with what Giles has done with any of his work. I, I will have other comments concerning maybe what they should have included in a box set, but that's not Giles' decision. Right, so, not. And he says you know, that. Yeah, and, and I'll. I, I think we'll leave you with this, um, and then we'll let Giles is, is in the corner t telling us to wrap it up because yeah. he wants to. He want you want he wants you to hear him. Um, but quite frankly, for those of you who have heard rumors five years ago about a revolver box, and were disappointed that it didn't come out before Pepper, um, I think. Uh, it's it's a good thing it didn't come out because if it yep. come out prior, we wouldn't have had the AI technology from Peter Jackson. And by the way, Peter Jackson is being very selfish with this and not letting any other band use it. So he's only letting the Beatles use it, which is really kind of cool. 
Yeah, um, hopefully uh, the Beatles say, yo, these Star Club tapes are just sitting here doing uh, nothing. Sh- you know, knows what we're going to get. But, AI would be great with those. But, but uh, just to wrap it up, I mean, again, thank goodness it's coming out now and they have the technology. I think Giles and Sam and everybody uh, involved did a great job. Uh, I'm really excited about the vinyl because you're getting the seven inch vinyl of paperback Rider and Rain. And, you know, the like Let It Be had a 12 inch vinyl uh, right. of the EP right. or whichever one it was. Um, so now you're getting the actual seven inch. Um, unfortunately, you're getting the UK picture sleeve, which was none <laughs> because yeah, they, yeah, they didn't well. put them out until Hey Jude or whatever it was. Um, but it doesn't matter because uh, I, unless you, now you're going to get people complaining that the, the, single is going to flop around in the box so someone always uh, has you know, the, about the, something I'm, right i'm not worried about that right now oh, so. i know me neither i can't wait supposedly the booklet is absolutely gorgeous uh it's done by kevin howlett who uh worked on uh the bbc stuff a few bun- uh yeah and he's worked on a bunch of beatles stuff he's he's an incredible yes, he historian so uh look for the box set you'll you'll have it soon and now i am uh, like i said at the top I'm going to pass it over to our friend Giles and those two idiots uh, who are interviewing him. That's us. That's us. <laughs> so, uh, we hope you enjoyed this. We hope you are as excited as we really are. And, we are. Uh, we can't wait for the box to come out. So for the Fab Four Free For All, um, Tony, we love you, but I'm Mitch and you are? Rob Leonard. Thank you for listening. All right, over to you, Giles. Over to you, okay? All right. So, uh, Giles, thank you for being here well, and helping us out with this interview. Um, so, with the AI um, Peter Jackson um, technology, you can now separate, if I'm saying it correctly, you can separate actually drums from Ringo's set? Well, yeah, okay, so it, it gets, you can. I mean, if you think about the way that a lot of early Beatles stuff was recorded, and early to mid Beatles stuff, um, you know, went from two track to four track, and all those four tracks were guitar, bass, and drums. Um, and when you get to mixing, that becomes limited because you can either put them on one side or the other or in the middle, which then becomes mono. From working with the Peter Jackson team on, on cleaning up dialogue funny, from the Nagras for Get Back, we started looking into this AI and machine learning technology, digging in. And at the end of last year, we started working out, can we, can, you know, a lot of people have been doing this, but not very well. Can we take the guitars off the drums? at the base of the drums and so we had guitar bass and drums separate and then i asked him okay can i now have a separate kick drum and snare drum so we could do that okay. so you're basically demixing the one track into three instruments guitar bass and drums and then demixing the demix it's like a like yeah. reverse bouncing if you like or yeah. what they did in the old days um from kick drum and snare drum and and cymbals so we could do that and and pretty effectively, actually, to the extent where you can, you know, we, we, we put them all back together again. So the drums, we don't, I mean, occasionally you'll hear on Tomorrow Never Knows, um, you'll hear the snare drum and toms left and right slightly. Okay. There is that. But, you know, if you have kick drum, snare drum, and cymbals, all mono, you're not going to put them left and right. So you, you said that you, were, you like to clarify uh, the music now uh, in a couple of different interviews instead of, you know, changing it and everything. With this technology, is there a... You know, is there a, can you fall into the trap of you maybe like the difference between changing and you creating a new mix or clarifying, as you say? Well, I am, well, I am, well listen, well, no, I am creating a new mix. I mean, th- without question, I'm creating a new mix. Okay. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not doing an old mix. Right. Because you have that. Okay. So, so Taxman, for instance, the Open Jack Revolver, the stereo mix has guitar, bass, and drums, hard pan, pan, left hand side. Yeah. Has vocals in the center has um, a cowbell and a lead guitar on the right hand side. Now I've now been in a situation where I can put the drums in the center, the guitars on the right, and the guitar on the right, and bass slightly, so guitar slightly right, bass slightly left. Now that's a new mix. Yes, it okay. is. Okay, without question. Um, people go, what gives you the right to touch our gold? Well, it, the Beatles do, to be honest. They're asking me to do it. It's not like yeah. going off and taking these tapes and going, like Gollum and saying, this is what I'm gonna do. You know, Paul and Ringo and Oliver and Yoko and Danny and Sean and the whole families get involved in all these things. Yeah. What I have to unlock is the technology so I can do it. That's yeah. the thing. So, so there's no point in me using the four track because essentially with a revolver, I'd be, you know, be doing the same thing as was originally done. 
Right. But what you get from this now, whether it's better or worse, that's up to you. But this isn't for yeah. you guys. I have to say, this isn't for you guys because you love the records and and well, you said, these things. yeah, exactly. You can compare them. It's for younger generations to go, okay, I'm listening to a 25 year old band slamming it in the studios. I do take off some layers of compression a bit, a little bit, and yeah. open it out a bit. But you hear the band in the room more because bands don't sit on each other's laps when they play. Yeah. You know, they play. Paul, of you know, in case of ta Tax Man, Paul, Ringo, and George are in different places in the room, so they must as well be different places in the sound field. That, that, that's the that's So, the one last thing. Okay. Does, this, does this technology work with more primitive recordings, such as like the two tracks of Please Please Me and With the Beatles? Would this, would this technology be able to work as, I as effectively? I, not a, I don't know yet, is okay. the answer. Um, it may do. Um, we need to push the boundaries more. And that's the cool thing about this, is like, this isn't a new thing. I mean, I use D-Mix technology eight days a week to remove the screams off them. You yeah, know, yeah. And so we could then dig in and you know, make the band sound a bit better. But it was really primitive. And I tried to, I then, in those days, I tried to go, okay, can I apply this to a revolver or rubber sole? I did, I tried some mixing, but it didn't sound very good. Mm. Um, now, this technology now does sound amazing, and it's only the Beatles that are using it right now, because it's Peter Jackson's proprietary technology, you won't let anyone else use it. Right. I mean, it's so far ahead of anyone else. And just, I have a role, I'm head of audio for Universal Music Group, and we're looking to a lot of, you know, special audio and mixing and stuff like that for anything, like hip-hop guys are struggling because they did things on samples, and they, you can't get the multi tracks. Oh, you know, well, right true. now, right now, we can only, only the Beatles are using that, and I think that's quite cool in a way, because, like, they, they've always pushed boundaries in technology. And you know the first special album was Sgt. Pepper's. You know, yeah. it's a, you know, I I think it's a good thing. So um, so yeah, it, it had to be the right time. By the way, Paul, to give my regards to Broad Street, is about a guy stealing the master tape. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, well, my question for you is, um, when you did Eight Days a Week, the Hollywood Bowl concert, you, I thought that it's a three-track tape. There was um, a way to extract some of it yeah. and bring it back. So what's the difference between? That and and this technology because I love Hollywood Bowl because the whole bottom end you can hear that. Yeah, the the, the principle is exactly the same. The difference with that is that I was essentially removing screams, <laughs> which are abundant on Hollywood Bowl. Sure. And then, but what I had, if you, if what I worked on was kind of like, didn't sound very good once the screams were off it, and I had to hurry suddenly stick it back together again. It's like you know someone you know reduce it, it, it the best way to, to to describe this is like you get given a cake and you want to give be given eggs milk flour and sugar back or whatever it is right. you, know, you want to get you know you want to get and butter you want to have those separate things now hollywood bowl there's a big smeary mess yeah but i had to put it back together again but i could improve the low end right on that without turning at the low end of the of the of the um of the crowd for instance so that was the thing it was like i take a layer off like a restoration stuck it back on with this, which you'll hear today, which I'll play you, it's unbelievable. Like you can hear Ringo's drums in a room with the with the tails and stuff on it, even oh. though there's a guitar playing with it. Yeah. It's un and I don't know, and I'm pretty good at this stuff. I don't know how it's done. <laughs> I, I know that you know New, yeah. New Zealand's infrastructure pretty closed down because the computer power that was used when they did it. But <laughs> it is just off the charts. I mean, like my, like my dad had heard this, you know, we'd been looking to try and do this for a long time. And it was only when we unlocked this during, you know, during the fact that we indulge ourselves in the pandemic by doing Get Back. Right. And that's the thing, is like crisis can, 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 can give you innovation. Oh, yeah. It was that, you know, it's, it is, it is, so it's exactly the same, really good question, exactly the same technology, but hugely developed. Okay. It's like, you know, it's like a Model T Ford compared to because a Because I thought the EMI has always been ahead of the game a lot with their technology. Yeah. And I thought, well, you guys did one thing and then Peter Jackson came and had a various version of it. But um, Yeah, it's just better. Yeah, and just and better. the guy, and James James Clark, who's great, who, 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 he said, you know, listen, I really want to, and I played it to him. And he was like, I mm. said, James, if you can beat this, <laughs> I'll, listen, I'll use anything. I don't, I don't you know, I, me and Peter got on really well, but it's not like, you know, and he would right. understand. It's like, it's just, this is really good. Mm. And he goes, I can't. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, his is the best at the yeah. moment. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I I have to ask, why no, and I think I know the answer, but why no Good Day Sunshine outtakes? Because there weren't any. I know there were only three takes and they yeah. used take one. Yeah. So when you hear stuff like that, you just say, look, it's, it's not worth it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. And then the other thing I have to ask you, because people are asking us, 
It's about the Blu-ray. Yeah, so that, okay, that's not my decision, for a start. I have nothing to do with packaging. Right. Okay, just so you know. No, I know, I you know. know. Whether, whether there's a Blu-ray or not, I mean, it's easy for me, because I've given them the files, and you can either put them on Blu-ray or stream it. Sure. I mean, in, in essence, when you come to Atmos Blu-ray, um, the quality is the same as streaming. There's no difference in... Right. It's, you know, there's, no, no, there's no difference in, in that. Um, but the older generation doesn't stream a lot, and the Beatles have an older yeah. audience. But I think what we're going to do, since the kickback, and I've had, I've had a lot of kickback and people writing angry letters towards me, even though it has <laughs> nothing to do with me, I think we'll just, we'll just release, at some point, we'll probably release a high-res Blu-ray, high-res audio file on Blu-ray for the, for, for the fans. Well, that'd be nice. Yeah, so it's, uh, I, it, it, it's not ignored. It's not no, like, I know. I, it's not like, I'm, it's not like you know, we are as the Beatles or Universal, because it's, as I say, it's not my decision. Yeah. A stonewalling people and going, this is not what we're doing. I mean, the, the, the reason is funny if there's demand for it, it's just dropped off. People don't have Blu-ray players. Or know, Atmos, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean Atm Atmos has, has, has gone up. Yeah. I mean, but still, it's it, not it, a... No, a, a, and the, the, Atmos, the, the amount of Atmos has, gr has grown exponentially. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Atmos that's great. Is, Atmos, but it's a different way of... See, 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 for you, you should like an audio file person, which is great. Yes. People on Apple Music treat it as this is what they want to have. Right. Yeah. You know, so it's a, uh, listen, I don't, anything that makes people listen to music and not just hear it is a good thing for me. And what I mean by that people engage passionately with what they, with what it is and that sort of stuff is great, especially newer generations. Like, you know, you guys are passionate anyway. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, I mean, we can hear what everyone's saying about it and I think we'll just address it. Yeah. I have a question about the mono mix. How much do you touch it? I mean, we know the stereo is remixed and gone through, but it's, it's not mixed. You know, well, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's just mastered. It's yeah, but you don't go back and redo a whole mono mix. It's just the one that was done in 1960. Correct, yeah. Correct. And that's been the whole, the, all the records. Yeah, there's no point in redoing a mono mix. Yeah, you put it back into, you know, take the basics and make your own mono mix. Yeah. But it's going to be, it's, it's, it's going to sound the same. Oh, okay. It's good to sound pretty much the same. It's like okay. it's not though. I mean, here's the thing: is that the reason. Well, I mean, there's a difference between a fallback stereo into mono and a mono mix. Yeah. I, there is absolutely, but the thing is, is that okay? I I'd like to think, and it's funny. I, I had this conversation in LA recently, that I'm working on these tracks and doing pretty much what I think my dad and Jeff Emmerich would have wanted to have done. Now I'm second guessing, but I had Paul and Ringo helping me. Right. What they would have done if they had this technology, if they had, if they yeah. could do this. If I'm doing doing a mono mix, I'm essentially just going their mono mix isn't very good, so I'm going to do a better version. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, it does. So with everything, with Sergeant Pepper's and with this and Let It Be and all that sort of stuff, it's like you know, okay, we now can do this. We can treat it in this way. Right. And and if I'm just doing a I'm mixing. This is Giles Martin's mono mix of the Beatles. It's like your mono mix is rubbish. So here's my mono mix. <laughs> I quite understand. Have another question. And the other reason is, is only you guys want to hear a mono mix. By the way, that's the other I don't even want to actually. I, I, I like. like I love the mono. Mix. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. So there's a whole. There is. There, and again, going back to your on a graduate career, you have to understand. Like my daughters who are 15 and 15 and 13. They'll say to me, have you heard this band, Dad? It's am they're amazing, and it's Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. <laughs> okay, or the Arctic Monkeys. Right. Or, and they are the same time period. The Arctic Monkeys and Fleetwood Mac are, what, 20 years apart? Yeah. yeah. And my daughters are the same, same time, because they're not around now. And the Beatles are the same time. Right. Because they're not about to die like we are. Okay, it's as simple as that. So it's for those generations that go, okay, I want to listen to the Arctic Monkeys, now I want to listen to Dr. Robert, and, I listen to, and, they, and there's a... There's a you know, the Beatles are 25 when they're, in 1966 when they're doing Revolver. They're always going to be 25. Yeah. To us, they're not. And so it's that, it's that, that process. It's, it's, it's so you can stimulate that passion, which you already have, but with a new generation. It's okay. do, we, do we finally get uh, a definitive answer whether Paul is on She Said, She Said? He's definitely on She Said. He's definitely on She Said. Did you talk to him about that? Because his, his memory is he had a fight with them and he left the studio. It's I, I didn't because it wasn't even a question. <laughs> no? I mean, yeah, he's definitely, it's him playing bass on She Said. Okay, definitely. good. And the yeah. last one for me is just, uh, 
you talked about your dad. Uh, did, did he ever have conversations about Revolver with you? Because I can imagine Tomorrow Never Knows being the first song that they brought in for a new album. Yeah. And I can imagine your father saying, geez, maybe maybe I need to visit their dentist and have tea with him because to understand what they're doing. I don't think, I think my dad was, this is the thing that was Revolver, which is, which is kind of, I think is fascinating, is that, you know, Paul said to me, 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 me and Paul sat down and listened to it, and he said, you know, this is us at our most individual in a way. You know, they'd stop being these, this four-headed beast in a, in a Beatles suit. Right. And yet, what they resorted back to the next album is they all wore suits and they were, became Sgt. Peppers, you know, but this is their, like, their, their we're together breaking up album. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. Every, you know, because this is our, so our most individual and they loved it. They lo- And they all were open to everything. Constantly, they were all open to everything, including my dad. Because it's surprising, though, this is someone who's musically very technical and adept and wanting to, you know, and suddenly there's a song which is just, just in the key of C and John plays an acoustic guitar and then, mm. but I think he liked the appeal of John sort of going, I want it to be a, a, you know, a voice from a mountaintop and all this kind of stuff and the way they developed, it's like, you know, they had the time to be able to, and the great thing about music is being open to making mistakes because then you're not being safe all the time. It doesn't cost anything. Right. I mean, it costs studio time, but it has studio time. Yeah. But it's not like they, but it's not that they made mistakes slowly. They, you know, because everyone does. Yeah, sure. They tried things, they and they tried things, and they tried things, and they developed. And that's what's great about you know we had this those big forum about me saying about not releasing everything or whatever. I said something like this. I was like, the point is, is that you know, for a start, the Beatles don't didn't want that anyway. <laughs> um, it was the most important thing. But it's it's about showing the progression of like you know the, on, on, I think we have two two takes of tomorrow never knows. And um, the way that the way that that song develops, and the way they make decisions based on how it's developed, and the way it evolves, is kind of like yeah. these early sketches in a gallery, and then you have the final picture. Yeah, and I think it's, that's a beautiful thing. It's like you know, that's that's what it's about. That's what, and they and and, and including my dad, they were open. He was open to everything. Like I can't think of another band that wouldn't get accused of being prog, but most of the stuff on Revolver. Oh yeah. Um, how many how many bands do a do a song with a string octet that we don't think about it being a song with a string octet? We just think it being Alan Rigby. Right. We don't think it being some sort of cod classical thing. It's not even trying to be classical. Mm. But it's, it is. It was released as a single, so people heard it differently than if they've just had the album. Yeah, but I, can you name another band that's done that? No, no. no yeah, I can't. It. It's like, <laughs> after yeah. after I did. No, but even mm-hmm. after, right. but but not but not even. I mean, I can't think of another band with a with just a voice and a string, well, quarter no. octave, which just like going, well, that's not a classical piece of music. Right. I mean, they were, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a very unusual record revolver because it's like seven different bands. It is. You know. I have one more question. Uh, Paul started during Revolver to do separate overdubs. Was that easier to help mix the album that he's playing sometimes with the band and sometimes after they recorded? Uh... There's not a lot of that. There's not a lot mm-hmm. of that. That's why it's paper. We're paper. We're talking about bass. Yeah, yeah. bass. Yeah. yeah. There's not a lot of separate bass. Okay. I mean, Rain and and is it Rain and Paperback Right? Paper yeah. has, has bass on it. But said the bass afterwards. There's not a lot of bass on its own. Okay. You know? And there's, there's um, so so yeah, it makes it easier. But it depends on what else is. It's like you know, if you have guitar, bass, and drums, or two guitars, piano, bass, and drums, and one bass. You can't just put the bass on the right hand side of the band. Right, the right, right. Side. You know, sometimes you, I guess you can. Or you can't just put the vocals on one side because the band's on the other side. When you're doing these mixes, you have to be. Sometimes the vocals are leaning one side or the other, but generally, as you're here today, have you heard the stereos? I've only heard No, no. We only heard okay. the Taxman. I can't wait to hear Rain because I heard uh, R- Ringo sounds like Keith Moon. <laughs> they tell us things like that. So that's what I meant to like the. Is what I meant by the, the clarity is what you what do you get now when you get this new technology? You suddenly have a kick drum. Yeah. Oh, okay. And you, have, you know, and and you hear Ringo's drums. The drums aren't necessarily louder. Maybe on she said they're a bit louder, but why not? You know, but yeah. but but you hear you hear him hit them. That's the thing. That's cool. Yeah. Cool. I hope right. you enjoy it. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Tyler. Uh, yeah. Appreciate Absolutely. it very much as always. Nice to see you both Thank of you. Fab Four Free For All was edited and produced by Tony Chiguardo at Word of Mouth Studios in Westbury, New York. The opening and closing theme is My Dolly 
by the band The Badge, featuring longtime listener Jeff Slate, available on its debut album Digital Retro and recent Best Of compilation, as well as from the Fab Four Free For All website. Thanks for listening to Fab Four Free For All.